Today we want to talk about normative science and how it can corrupt so-called regular or traditional science. So let's start with the idea of exactly what is science. Science is really simply information, but its information is gathered with four characteristics that are essential. It's rational, that is, it relies on the senses, human senses, to gather information data. Secondly, it's systematic. A person can describe exactly how the information was collected, how it was analyzed, and how it was interpreted. Third, it's testable. That is, you're able to go out and test to determine if what you observed is actually accurate. In other words, it does not rely on faith or some other uh, faith-based argument to validate it. And fourth, it's reproducible. If other people repeat your methods, your procedures, your analyses, they come up with the same answer within a range of statistical error. So it essentially has to be reproduced. Now this whole process is codified in the scientific method, uh, which has been around for three or 400 years, at least in popular usage. Well, from a policy and management perspective, it's important to keep in mind that science is only one type of information. It's an important type of information. Many argue that even within policy and management, it's not the most important kind of information. And there are other kinds of information. Uh, there's information, what we generally call experiential knowledge, which is people based on people experience. For example, fishermen who may have fished commercially or recreationally for multiple generations uh, will have a long-term uh, information base based on their, their experience and their parents and grandparents, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, there's indigenous knowledge where people have been around for a long period of time. And while it's not scientific information, it's information nonetheless. It's also important to recognize that scientific information is information that describes the way the world is, not the way the world ought to be. So there is no ought statements or should statements in science. It just describes the way things are, or if you adopt this particular policy choice, here are the way the world might change or likely will change. So again, the is-ought separation is important. Science deals with the is, Policy, decision-making, management deals with the ought or shoulds. One issue that you have uh, these days and have for quite a while is the issue of advocacy, policy advocates masquerading as scientists. In theory, scientists have no policy preferences. They just provide information, relevant information, but they provide information. Advocates, in contrast, push a particular policy. They are trying to sell something, and that's perfectly legitimate, perfectly reasonable, and we should expect that from advocates. But here's the challenge. Imagine that you have a person who has scientific credentials, and he also is working as a scientist, but his day job, if you will, is to gather information on some relevant topic. And so here's this person in a yellow circle working in the field, gathering data and so forth. But that evening, that exact same person, that scientist, is presenting a talk, public ceremony, a public talk at a meeting arguing about, for example, whether a wind farm ought to be built. Now, is that scientist sticking to the science or is that scientist subtly or not so subtly pushing a policy preference? So this dichotomous role that sometimes occurs Whereas part of a person's life, they are a policy neutral scientist, the one on the left, but another part of their life, they are a policy advocate who happens to be a scientist. And in this particular case, we call this issue the issue of the advocate masquerading as a scientist. This is tough for the public, decision makers, and others to figure out if a scientist is playing the science straight up or is it being slanted towards a particular policy preference? Well, a couple of, several cautions here. First of all, science is not value-free, definitely not value-free. Uh, it's not value-free because the mere decision to use the scientific method to gather data is in itself a value choice. There are other ways to gather data. The scientific method is only one. Experiential knowledge can be very important, very common, and lots of folks would probably put more confidence in that than the scientific method. So it's not value-free, but 
it's expected to be policy neutral. That is, it does not subtly lead the reader towards a particular policy preference. It just presents the science straight up. And ideally, we expect science, or maybe hope for science, to be policy relevant. Most scientific information is not even marginally relevant to policy issues, but there's some fraction of scientific information that's highly relevant, and we hope that the science that's available is policy relevant. But the issue that we're going to talk about more specifically now is normative science. And this is a corruption of science because its information is presented in a way that looks like regular science, it sounds like regular science, it's presented by people who either call or imply that they are in fact working as scientists, but it is a corruption of science. It is not policy neutral. It has a built-in policy bias. So normative science. Well, how does regular science or traditional science become normative science? Charles Darwin had the pithiest expression for this. That is a scientific man ought to have no wishes, no affections, a mere heart of stone. That is, you play the science the way it is. You don't overlay what you think might nice to be true or could be true, should be true. The question is, the data speak for themselves. The formal definition of normative science is information, or what is oftentimes called science, but it's not really science, but information that is based on an assumed and usually unstated preference for a particular policy or class of policy. And the usually unstated is crucial because oftentimes the built-in policy bias is unseen by the average listener or average reader. Well, passing off normative science as if it was regular science is not okay. Um, this is, in my view, a clear corruption of science, of science and the scientific method. And using normative science, especially if you're a scientist, is a form of policy advocacy. Now, it's perfectly okay for policy advocates to use whatever techniques, normative science or otherwise, to try to sell their policy preferences. That's what they do. They are trying to sell something. But a scientist should be policy neutral. Stick to the is statements, avoid the should statements. So using normative science by scientists is a form of policy advocacy. Well, normative science is common. And let me just use a few examples here, one example particularly. And that's the idea that why is it in science publications, some science publications, native species are assumed to be preferable to non-native species. Now, native species or non-native species, either one, the public, the policymakers, others, could arbitrarily categorize any group of species as better or worse than others. Those are policy choices. They're not scientific choices. But I would argue that in science, when you, these types of terms are used, it is, in fact, advocacy masquerading as science. In science, for example, we usually, to most people or some people, usually assume that native species are just taken as a given. They are superior to non-native species. But let's look at some of these. Here we have the honeybee. Now, honeybees for the last several years have not done all that well. And most people are quite unhappy about that because honeybees perform a particularly important role in agriculture. Now, are people happy or unhappy about that? Well, in general, I would say they're unhappy because everybody loves honeybees, they need to do well, but they are a non-native species, but we love them. Or we can look at the second species, the zebra mussels. These zebra mussels are about the size of a dime, very small, but they occur in large, large clusters. They're filter feeders, so there is a characteristic of them to clear the water. And, and these animals are generally regarded as pests. They clog water systems and they cause all kinds of problems for water managers. People regard these as a pest, but they are also non-native. So we have one species that they love, one species that they hate. And let's look at the horse, the wild horse, the mustang, the icon of the wild west in the United States and Canada. 
These animals are either loved or hated, depending on your policy preference. Some people feel they ought to be eradicated from the entire West. Uh, at least they all, if they are kept there at all, they ought to be kept on private land and run as livestock. And others who feel that they are, in fact, an icon and ought to be not killed, not removed, but they ought to be encouraged to be there because they are, in fact, part of the culture, corporate, the overall culture of the area. Well, about half the people have one side of that argument and the other people have the other side of the argument. The take home message here is that values determine good or bad species, not science. So in science, watch for policy preferences that imply that a particular species is inherently good or bad, preferred or not preferred. Well, who decides these issues? I would argue that the decision is made by the public, individuals, and so forth. It's not made by scientists. For example, here we have two pieces of real estate in the same part of the country. They are virtually right next door. On the left, we have a tall grass prairie operating exactly as a tall grass prairie should do. Never been plowed, never been altered. On the right, we have essentially the same piece of land but is intensively managed for corn. Now, which one of these two is healthy and which one of these two is improved or degraded? It depends. If the goal on the left is to maintain these areas in their quote, natural unaffected by human state, in this particular case, the one on the left is a conservation easement, it is successful. On the one on the right, exactly the same land essentially, it's being used to produce corn to produce ethanol. Is this improved, degraded? What is this? The point of this is this process is a public policy decision making, not one for scientists to decide. Those two lands, those two states of that land are very different. No question about it. There's substantial differences in how the nutrients function and everything else, but they are not inherently good or bad until you apply a value preference to the issue. Well, let me make a general assertion about science. From my observations these days, science is often biased towards natural, that is conditions that are unaffected by humans. So the question is, are unaltered ecosystems inherently superior? I would argue the answer is clearly no. How do I determine if I'm a scientist, how do I determine if I have slipped into normative science? In other words, wording here is crucial and it's not so much what you intend to convey to people, it's what people hear your science say. I think the best test is to ask others who are not involved, they are quote, average people, what policy message is conveyed when they read your scientific speech or scientific text? Are they being led towards a particular policy preference? If the answer is yes, you need to go back and reword your statement to make it come across as sticking to the science, that is the is statements, and avoid any implication of the should statements, the ought statements. Other indicators of normative science, wording such as healthy, sick, crisis, degraded, these are words that imply that somebody has defined a good condition and a bad condition. Perfectly reasonable, but it's an activity for public policy debates, not for scientific determinations. When readers read these words, the assumption is that whatever state's being talked about is either degraded or improved or healthy or sick or whatever. That is not science. That is implicit advocacy, i.e. normative science. Let me wrap up and advise all of you who are scientists in training to prepare for this challenge. Imagine that you are lecturing, providing information to a commission, a panel, whatever, about a particular policy problem. And your job is to bring that into science. And you know, you've taken classes in this and so forth, so you're well aware of what is science and what is advocacy and so on. But you need to be aware that if you're dealing with high visibility issues, you will be pressured. You will be pressured from your colleagues sometimes, from your employer sometimes, and from the public sometimes. 
An issue that involves is very divisive, has strong opinions. Scientists will be under a lot of pressure to present their science in a way that supports or detracts from a particular policy position. So learn to identify the proper use of science before a crisis blindsides you. You're not going to be very effective if you drop the first time you get involved into one of these kinds of issues and you don't have a clear understanding of where science stops and policy advocacy begins. And especially, a final message, remember about ecological policy and management. Science is only one of many inputs into policy deliberations. In fact, many people would argue that's not even the most important kind of information. It is important but it's only one of many types of information and other inputs into policymaking. Secondly, normative science, that is science that has an embedded policy preference, does have a corrosive effect on the scientific enterprise. The public has a right to be skeptical of scientists who slip into advocacy, because how can they trust with confidence a scientist's policy neutrality when they know the scientist has strong policy preferences? Thank you.